we have come to our third and final walk together at Calvary Cemetery in Los Angeles, California. In parts one and two, we visited with many of the biggest names to appear on the silver screen and explored the myths and stories that made them legends. Now in part three, we will meet the people about whom the movies are made. Not all their names will be familiar, but their stories might be, because for better or worse, they help shape the times in which we now live. Many of the trails they blazed for us to follow are broad, well-tramped, and filled with light, but others are narrow and crooked and will take us into dark places. Some of the people we will meet were good, some bad, some heroes, some cowards. Some were aware that they were making history, but most simply got in history's way. They are all here with us now, and they have waited a long time to have their stories told. Come walk with me into the realm of our forefathers. When they came to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 33. Calvary is the Latin word for Golgotha, meaning the place of a skull, and was the name of the hill located outside of Jerusalem, where, according to the New Testament, Jesus was crucified. Over the centuries, the name was adopted by Catholic churches and cemeteries. Calvary Cemetery in East Los Angeles is one of the oldest in the city. However, it wasn't always located where it is today. The original or old Calvary Cemetery was established in 1844 and occupied land in Chavez Ravine, close to where Dodger Stadium currently stands. The site is the current home of Cathedral High School. Perhaps out of respect for those once buried there, the school has named their football team the Phantoms. By the 1880s, Old Cavalry had seen better days. According to contemporary newspapers, it had become an encampment for vagrants and ruffians and was reduced to a garbage dump. The graves of many old pioneers were subject to vandalism and robbery. In 1903, thieves broke into the vault of Pio Pico, the former governor of Alta California and a significant landowner in the state. The corpse of Pico's wife was removed from its coffin and the bones scattered throughout the graveyard. The Los Angeles Herald reporter who detailed the vandalism found her skull sitting atop one of the tombs. When New Cavalry Cemetery opened for business in 1896, many families began transferring loved ones there from the original location. Today a memorial stands in remembrance of the old cemetery and to all those who rested there. At the heart of Cavalry stands the majestic All Souls Chapel. Its cornerstone was laid on All Souls Day 1902 and the completed building was opened for worship one year later. Elements of its rustic design were inspired by St. Giles Parish Church in Stoke Pogis, Buckinghamshire, England, where poet Thomas Gray wrote his masterpiece on mortality, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. Buried within shadow's reach of the chapel spire are the humble priests and exalted prelates of the Los Angeles Diocese. Beneath this statue is the very Reverend Aloysius Meyer, 
who came to Los Angeles in 1884 as a member of the Vincentian Order. As president of St. Vincent's College, he helped establish that institution as the first school of higher learning in the city. It is still in operation to this day as Loyola Marymount College. Among his other accomplishments was the creation of St. Vincent's Church. After his death in 1898, the city's Catholics honored his memory by erecting a statue of St. Vincent de Paul at his gravesite. Its dedication was widely reported in the press. Along the path leading to All Souls Chapel is Cardinal Timothy Manning, the third Archbishop of Los Angeles, serving from 1970 to 1985. Although holding to a traditional Catholic doctrine, his term was also noted for a markedly more progressive stance toward race and the sexes than his predecessors. He was a cardinal elector in the conclaves of August and October 1978 that selected Popes John Paul I and John Paul II. He retired in 1985 as Archbishop Emeritus and spent his remaining years at the Holy Family Parish in Pasadena. Also buried near the chapel are Catholic nuns and throughout the grounds can be found monuments to their various orders. This elaborately carved monument marks the grave of Bonaventura Fox, the first superior of the Sisters of Mercy in Los Angeles. Their order's mission is to pray and give aid to the sick and poor. Behind the chapel is this life-size sculpture of a nun in death, resting upon a draped funeral bier that is covered in roses. It is dedicated to the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles. The order was founded in the 1920s by Sister Maria Luisa Josefa. Travelers on the 60 freeway through East Los Angeles have probably noticed the large yellow and white cross standing on the northwest corner of Calvary Cemetery. However, many of them might not be aware of its significance. On September 10, 1987, Pope John Paul II began a nine-city tour of the United States. It would mark the first papal visit to the city of Los Angeles, on September 16th, the last night of his two-night stay, he held Mass at Dodger Stadium. The event was attended by 63,000 of the faithful, while millions more watched on television. One of the most visible features was the large cross towering over the stage. After the Pope's visit, the cross was placed here in Calvary as a marker for commuters and a reminder of a special event in the lives of Southern California's Catholic community. What makes Cavalry unique among Southern California cemeteries are its large number of figural sculptures. In many ways, it's like exploring a vast open-air museum. Everywhere are works of art created by craftsmen who crossed an ocean and a continent, bringing old-world traditions into the new. For many years, Cavalry was the only Catholic burial ground available. Families, rich and poor, traveled here from great distances to lay their loved ones to rest. And those who could afford it wanted something beautiful to mark the graves. 
They wanted something that not only spoke of the station they held in life, but also expressed their faith in what awaits us in the next. Here in the old part of the cemetery are many of Los Angeles' earliest residents who bridged the old world and the new. Rhode Islander Robert Symington Baker came to California during the gold rush of 1849. He became a wealthy cattleman and landowner. Subdividing part of his holdings, he created the town of Santa Monica, and there he built the Arcadia Hotel that was named after his wife. Frank Lacouvera was a county surveyor and the director of the Farmers and Merchants Bank. He was partially paralyzed for the last few years of his life, a fact that is evident in his epitaph. Louis Mesmer had been a successful baker in France when he arrived in Los Angeles around 1860. With the profits from his new bakeries, he purchased large tracts of land in the growing city. A jack of all trades, he was involved in mining and even supervised the construction of St. Vibiana's Cathedral. He also became a hotelier when he bought the U.S. Hotel, which also served as his home until his death in 1900. The Sentas family were so highly respected in Los Angeles that when they were struck with a double tragedy on December 6, 1911, the day both father and son died, it was said that their funerals were the largest ever held in the city. Zach Montgomery came to California from Kentucky in 1850 in search of gold, but became a lawyer instead, practicing in Yuba City and Sacramento. At the start of the Civil War, he was living in San Francisco, where he published The Occidental, a pro-South periodical. His offices were destroyed by a mob angry at his views. While practicing law in San Diego, he was called upon to serve as Assistant U.S. Attorney General during President Grover Cleveland's first term. Don Manuel Dominguez was born in 1803 at Mission San Juan Capistrano and became the heir of the vast Rancho San Pedro land grant. There he raised cattle and served in various public functions. After California's annexation, the Dominguez family continued to be a major influence in the growth and prosperity of Los Angeles. When Maria Sormano died from a concussion after being found unconscious on the street in front of her home, the police believed her death was the work of the notorious John Bull White, who attacked unsuspecting women in the dark of night. He was charged with misdemeanor assault in the brutal beating of another woman, but no evidence was found that he was responsible for the death of Maria Sormano. In the end, the reform school dropout was released back into society. Today, the placid stone gaze of the daughter of the old Spanish dons greets those who pass by her grave.
Stephen Mallory White was born in San Francisco in the years following the gold rush. He became a lawyer and drifted into politics in 1883 after becoming the Los Angeles District Attorney. Ten years later, he would become the first California native to represent his state in the United States Senate. While in Congress, he sponsored the San Pedro Harbor Bill, bringing unprecedented prosperity to Southern California. His death in 1901 was a cause of great public mourning. In 1908, a memorial statue was erected to his memory. Kentuckian William Wolfskill was a trapper and explorer who blazed many a trail across the Southwest. He came to Los Angeles in 1831 where he began cultivating citrus groves and vineyards. Many members of his large family are also buried here at Calvary. Wolfskill's daughter Frances married Charles Shepard who amassed a great fortune in Southern California real estate. The Wolfskill Monument is visible on the left of this shot. Another family whose dealings in real estate would have a large impact on the future was that of Jean-Pierre de Guerre. He left his native France in 1879 to come to America, and it was on that journey he met his future wife, Maria Eugenia. He settled on a large ranch in the area between Los Angeles and San Diego, where he made his living raising sheep. His life met a tragic end on a country road in 1911. While out for a carriage ride, his horse was spooked by an approaching automobile and bolted. Jean-Pierre was thrown from the carriage and died from his injuries. The property left to his four children became, within their lifetimes, some of the most upscale communities in South Orange County. Throughout the cemetery are the graves of the nation's veterans. They fought on land, sea, and in the air. In places called Cerro Gordo, Vicksburg, the Black Hills, Guantanamo Bay and Manila, from Chateau Thierry to the Argonne, Guam, Normandy, and North Africa, from Seoul to Inchon and the Chosin Reservoir, to Saigon, Hui, and Hill 861A, from Beirut to Fallujah and Tora Bora and everywhere in between. Theirs is a brotherhood of battle that reaches through time and through the hearts and minds of a people. And here in Calvary, their patron is St. Patrick. The statue was dedicated on March 18, 1945, in remembrance of Los Angeles' Catholics who gave their lives in World War II. It has since been rededicated for all who made the supreme sacrifice in service of their country. Like Hawthorne Moles, who was a 20-year-old clerk at Nordlinger's department store when the United States entered the First World War. He joined the Marine Corps and served with the storied 2nd Division. He was killed by a high-explosive shell on October 4, 1918, during the second day of the Battle of Blancmont Ridge. Of the battle that ultimately drove the Germans out of long-held territory, the 2nd Division's commander, Major General John Lejeune, said, To be able to say when this war is finished, I belong to the 2nd Division, I fought with it at the Battle of Blancmont Ridge, will be the highest honor that can come to any man. Hawthorne's body was returned home for burial on August 20th, 1921. A generation after Hawthorne Moles sailed to France to fight the Kaiser, another young man became a United States Marine. For Eugene Obregón, a teenager from Boyle Heights, 
the Marine Corps was a gateway into a world he could only imagine. In June 1950, Communist-controlled North Korea invaded the Western-backed South. Acting quickly, the United Nations went to their aid. That summer, Jean was sent to Korea as part of the 1st Marine Division. It was the beginning of what would become a devastating three-year war. Within the first two months of his arrival, Private First Class Obregon tasted combat at Pusan and Incheon. In late September, his rifle company took part in the drive to retake the capital city of Seoul that was being occupied by North Korean forces. The battle was fought from street to street and house to house. On the 26th of September, Obregon's company became pinned down by enemy fire. After taking cover, he witnessed fellow Marine Private First Class Burt Johnson fall wounded. With no thought for his own safety, Gene ran out to the man and carried him to the side of the road. While he was bandaging his wounds, hostile troops advanced on them. Using his body to shield the injured man, Gene returned their fire and effectively repelled the attack, enabling fellow Marines to come to their rescue. But by then it was too late for Gene, who had been cut down by enemy machine gun fire. Private First Class Eugene Arnold Obregon was 19 years old when he died saving the life of Burt Johnson. His body was returned home the following May, and an LA Times photographer was on hand at the train depot to capture his parents' heartbreak. In August 1951, Obregon was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above the call of duty. It was presented to his mother who stood beside the man whose life her son had saved. Jean was buried with full military honors. Today his grave is a quiet place but these grainy images of his funeral have not lost their power. They recall countless similar scenes that have played out through the ages in cemeteries across the globe as the ranks of the Brotherhood of Battle continues to grow. Standing among the monuments and headstones are the private mausoleums belonging to the pioneering families of Los Angeles. Their opulence mirror the mansions they owned in life as well as their vision for what their city would become. Felix and Teresa Mancho were early settlers in Los Angeles. When Felix died in 1890, he was originally interred at Old Calvary. After the death of his wife Teresa in 1896, he was moved here. Their mausoleum is one of the earliest in the new cemetery. Within this mausoleum rests Maria Antonia Wilcox. She was the daughter of Santiago Arguello, the last Spanish governor of California before the start of Mexican rule. In 1863, she married Alfred Henry Wilcox, a sea captain and early California settler who began his own steamship line. Renowned for her great beauty, Maria was said to be a great society hostess. At the time of her death in 1909, her fortune was in excess of $2 million. This is the resting place of Billy Rowland, who from 1872 to 1875 was the sheriff of Los Angeles County. He is best remembered for coordinating the capture of the notorious bandito and revolutionary Tiburcio Vasquez in 1874. In later life, Rowland discovered oil and invested in large tracts of land, making him a very wealthy man by the time of his death. 
Most of Calvary's private mausoleums are situated on this road leading from the old section of the cemetery to the new. Their placement is reminiscent of those found along the Via Appia in the ancient city of Rome. It is not surprising in a city vast as Los Angeles that we should find here so many of its builders and visionaries. One is John Brockman, who left his native Germany as an orphan at the age of eight and settled in Illinois. After serving in the Union Army during the Civil War, he moved west and became the owner of the Commonwealth Mine. Later he came to Los Angeles and invested heavily in real estate and construction. One of his buildings is located on 7th and Grand in downtown Los Angeles. Built in 1912, it is known as the Brockman Lofts and is still standing to this day. Standing beside the Brockman Mausoleum is the resting places of Jacob Matthew Snyder and family. A longtime businessman in the city, Jacob was the president of J.W. Robinson's department store that was in a building constructed by John Brockman, his neighbor in death. Charles Ferdinand Kanowski was a furniture maker when he came to America from Germany in 1880. Settling in Los Angeles in 1915, he founded the Western Upholstery Company. His eldest son, Urban, followed him in his trade and by age 25 was part owner in the family business. A bright future seemed guaranteed until tragedy struck in 1927. While duck hunting near Bakersfield with his three younger brothers, Urban's gun accidentally discharged, killing him instantly. Despite their terrible loss, the family business thrived for many years to come. Michael Connell was a merchant, a banker, a builder, and philanthropist. His wife Agnes organized many charities and fundraisers. During the First World War, she was the chairperson of the Enlisted Men's Club of Los Angeles and personally served coffee and donuts to young men going off to fight. Her untimely death in an auto accident was widely mourned. After his wife's death, Michael continued with his charitable work and added many buildings to the Los Angeles skyline until his own death in 1935. Philip Forve from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania was married to Louise Stegmeier, the daughter of the founder of Stegmeier Brewery. He came to Los Angeles in 1900 where he formed the Forve Pettibone Corporation that made some of the first electric street lights in the city. In 1905, an article appeared in the Los Angeles Times about the construction of a private mausoleum as big as a house. The cost was conservatively estimated to be $25,000 roughly 700,000 today. It was built for Thomas Higgins, whose life mirrored that of John Brockman. Higgins made a fortune in mining copper before coming to Los Angeles, where he invested in real estate and built downtown office buildings. The Higgins building is still standing on 2nd and Main. As for his mausoleum, it would have to wait 15 years after its completion before Thomas took up permanent residence there. Eliza Wilson was another real estate mogul. She was said to have laid out one of the first tracts of land in Los Angeles. Secundo Guasti came to Los Angeles from Italy in 1883. The son of a vintner, he would become one of the premier wine producers of his day. He formed the Italian Vineyard Company near Ontario, California, where he purchased 5,700 acres and established the town of Guasti to house his workers and their families. After his death in 1927, his company passed to his son Secundo Jr 
who ran it until his untimely death in 1933. Gowasti's widow, Louisa, supported many Catholic charities for the remainder of her days. One of the early burials at New Cavalry was of Stephen Clark Foster, the city's first American-born alcalde, or mayor, who served from 1848 to 1850 during the period of California's annexation to statehood. Born in New England and educated at Yale University, Foster came to the Pueblo of Los Angeles in 1847 as an interpreter for Captain Philip St. George Cook, who commanded the Mormon Battalion of Volunteers. Cook would later serve as a general in the Union Army during the Civil War. After Foster's term as alcalde expired, he was elected as a member of the 1849 California Constitutional Convention that met in Monterey. He married the daughter of Jose del Carmen Lugo, a prominent landowner. The couple was blessed with five children, but the union was said to be an unhappy one. Foster served two terms as California State Senator and was elected mayor of Los Angeles in 1854. During his tenure, he approved construction of the city's first public school. On January 28, 1898, Stephen Clark Foster died, alone and penniless. A Times article on February 2nd detailed the sad final days of the scholarly man who worked tirelessly for the city and state he helped build. The Great Mausoleum has many small burial chambers that are accessible only from the outside. In one of these, located to the right of the forecourt, is the crypt of an early major league ball player. Johnny Lush is not a name that is well remembered by most casual baseball fans, but he held a record with the Philadelphia Phillies that would stand for nearly 60 years. Born in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Johnny made his major league debut as a pitcher with the Phillies in 1904. The Southpaw didn't have a remarkable career, but on May 1, 1905, he pitched a no-hitter against the Brooklyn Superboss at Washington Park. No Phillies pitcher would duplicate the feat until Jim Bunning's perfect game against the New York Mets in 1964. Ironically, the scores of both games, 6 and 0, were the same. In 1907, Johnny left Philadelphia to play with the St. Louis Cardinals. He finished his baseball career playing single-A and double-A ball, first with the Toronto Maple Leafs, then finally with the Portland Beavers. After retiring from baseball, he moved to Los Angeles with his wife, Etta where they owned and operated a gift shop at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Johnny Lush passed away in 1946 at the age of 61. On May 30th, 1922, thousands attended the dedication ceremony of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The dignitaries present that day were President Warren Harding with former President Taft and future President Coolidge, as well as Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd. Among the many speakers was this bearded gentleman with flowing white hair. In this rare footage, he is briefly seen reading a poem he composed about Lincoln, a man of the people. In an age when poetry was still widely read, nearly everyone was familiar with the works of poet Edwin Markham. Through his works, Markham became a champion of labor and an eloquent voice for reformers. 
He came to the cause after seeing the Jean-Francois Millet painting titled The Man with the Hoe. It inspired him to write his most famous and controversial poem of the same name. Upon its publication in 1899, it took the world by storm and sent a collective shudder through plutocrats and industrialists everywhere. In fact, railroad magnate Collis P. Huntington was so incensed that he offered a $700 prize to anyone who could write a suitable rebuttal to the man with the hoe. Huntington went to the grave without ever awarding the prize. Although his later works would not have the same success as The Man with the Hoe, Markham continued to publish articles and books geared toward reform, including several about child labor. Always a popular guest speaker, he gave poetry recitals until the end of his life, which came on March 7, 1940. At his passing, fellow poet John Stephen McRorty recalled the time he saw Markham giving a reading in the shade of an oak tree. Comparing him to Homer, his colleague wrote, God does not make but a few great poets, and Edwin Markham was one of them. John Stephen McRorty was a man of many hats. In addition to being California's poet laureate, he was a playwright, an author, historian, journalist, and two-term member of Congress. A Pennsylvanian by birth, he moved to Montana where for a time he was an executive for a copper mine. In 1901 he came to Los Angeles where he remained for the rest of his life. There he wrote histories of California's missions and settlers, including the popular and long-running mission play that was performed at a specially built playhouse in San Gabriel. For the Lincoln Centennial edition of the Los Angeles Times in 1909, McRorty wrote an essay on the progress of African Americans since emancipation. His compassion and understanding of their hardships earned him great respect in the black community. While in Congress, he was a champion of the Townsend Pension Plan that was a forerunner to the Social Security Act of 1935. In 1923, McGrory built a home called Chupa Rosa in the hills of Tahunga, California. It was his retreat from a busy public life. After a full life, John McGrory passed away on August 7, 1944. The funeral for the celebrated poet and historian was attended by hundreds of admirers. Over his gravesite were read the last few lines of verse that McGrory ever wrote. They were appropriately titled, Requiem. When I have had my little day, my chance at toil, my fling at play, and in the starry silence fall, with broken staff against the wall, may someone pass God grant that way, and as he bends above me say, Good night, dear comrade, sleep you well. After coming out west to make movies, Orson Welles famously observed that Los Angeles is a bright and guilty place. He saw through its splendid veneer to the shadowy underworld that writers the likes of Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, and James M. Cain wove into tales of urban noir. Where nothing is as it seems, where heroes act like villains, and where even a city of angels can be home to the devil. In the early years of the 20th century, a strange creature could be found plying the dingy streets and back alleys of Chinatown. His withered and wrinkled form was said to haunt the abandoned tenements he owned that in days gone by echoed with the shrieks and moans peculiar to the brothels that thrived there. For more than 50 years he was the Tsar of the Tenderloin, the Emperor of Chinatown, and the King of Cribs. When he walked abroad he was met with whispers about the vast fortune he commanded even though he lived and dressed like a beggar. His name was Bartolo Ballerino, 
an Italian by birth who made his way to L.A. in the 1850s via Chile. Within a few years of his arrival, he owned most of the city's red light district near Chinatown. Ballerino did not directly operate the brothels. Instead, he rented out the rooms or cribs where the fallen ladies serviced their clients. He bribed corrupt ward bosses and policemen who turned a blind eye to his illicit enterprises. Later in life, he became a curiosity of sorts, as his name always seemed connected with one scandal or another. Even the divorce from his wife Maria of 40 years made headlines. Reporters delighted in describing his ragged appearance, down to the homemade hair dye he used that was said to match the color of crushed strawberries. By 1904, the city began clamping down on the crib owners. Ballerino and his ilk were the targets of new ordinances designed to put them out of business. The legal battle that ensued was described almost daily in the press. Ballerino, who by then was nearly 80 years of age, fought with the tenacity of a grizzly bear to keep his empire. But in the end, the reform movement won the day and the cribs were closed and his dilapidated buildings condemned. Ballerino spent the last few years of his life attended by a few of his former tenants, whose ministrations were bought with empty promises of making them inheritors of his fortune. Bartolo Ballerino died on July 11, 1909, and in keeping with his miserly ways was buried in an unmarked grave in Calvary Cemetery. Nearby is his wife Marie, who died not long after. She went to her grave, fighting for control of his estate. In the years following his death, a few treasure seekers went searching the old cribs for the miser's gold but they all went away empty-handed. Standing near to where he is buried, you can almost make out the sound of Ballerino getting the last laugh. On September 14, 1920, a brief article appeared in the LA Times about a pool room shootout on East 9th Street. The two men who started the fight were rushed to the hospital with serious injuries, but died soon after being admitted. One of the dead men was the 24-year-old owner of the pool room, Jack Blandino. He left behind his parents and seven siblings, as well as many unanswered questions. With the scant information police gathered from witnesses, they concluded that the shooting was the result of a dispute over the illegal sale of alcohol. The 18th Amendment, which prohibited the production, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor, had been in place for less than a year when this now forgotten act of violence took place. Prohibition did little to curtail the scourge of demon liquor that its champions had hoped for. In fact, it seemed only to increase the demand, which compelled many to go into the distillery business for themselves. Early in the morning of August 3, 1926, the Los Angeles Fire Department were called to a fire at a residential dwelling. After the flames were extinguished, they discovered that the fire had been caused by the explosion of a 50-gallon still that was used for making whiskey. Further evidence of this was the more than 100 barrels of mash found in the rubble. They also made the grim discovery of the charred remains of two young men. They were Sam Minchella and his friend Joe Borgoina. Both were 18 years old. Also in the house were Sam's mother and two sisters, who barely escaped the flames with their lives. Sam's mother, who was held on charges of manslaughter, claimed that the two boys had been hired by the distiller to keep an eye on his operation. The mother was exonerated for the deaths of her son and his friend. Perhaps the authorities thought she had been punished enough. 
On the morning of August 3, 1926, boyhood friends Sam Minchella and Joe Burgoyna died together and were buried next to one another here at Cavalry. Their images, frozen in eternal youth, gaze out from the headstones. Nothing was engraved on either of them to tell us they were friends or to relate the cautionary tale that their brief lives came to represent. The stories of Jack Blandino, Sam Minchilla, and Joe Burgoyna are only three of countless others that unfolded in similar fashion during the 13-year lifespan of Prohibition, a period of time that also saw the birth of organized crime in America. Here in front of the great mausoleum are the graves of an Italian immigrant and his wife. Jack Dragna made his living as a banana merchant, or at least that's what he told the government. But everyone knew that for a quarter of a century he was the head of organized crime in Los Angeles and was often referred to as the Capone of California. After getting his start in extortion and bootlegging, Dragna rose to power in the 1930s. His criminal enterprise was built on prostitution, gambling, protection, and narcotics. His family survived through a tense alliance with the more powerful East Coast families. Dragna bowed to Benjamin Bugsy Siegel when he made his splashy entrance on the LA scene. The two were said to have established a racing wire together. After Siegel's murder in 47, Dragna's fiercest rival was Mickey Cohen. Dragna was believed to have had a hand in the several failed attempts on Cohen's life, including the dramatic bombing of his house in February 1950. Five Dragna associates were implicated, including his brother and nephew, while Jack fled the state to avoid questioning. When reporters asked Cohen about Dragna, he replied, He's one of my closest friends. Throughout his criminal career, Jack managed to avoid prison, although he was charged with contempt for refusing to answer the questions of Senator Estes Kefauver's Commission on Organized Crime. In 1951, he pled guilty to lewd vagrancy and spent six months in jail. Two years later, immigration officials ordered his deportation when it was discovered that he'd been living in the country illegally. He would fight the order on appeal for the rest of his life. Jack Dragna met his fate on February 23, 1956. Not in a hail of bullets, but from a heart attack he suffered in his sleep. In November 1957, residents of a quiet hamlet in upstate New York noticed a large number of expensive cars with out-of-state license plates coming into their town. And local hotels began filling up with an unlikely set of tourists. State and federal authorities were alerted, and on November 14th they converged on the hilltop retreat of Joseph Barbara. They detained 65 men that day in what would be called the Appalachian Summit of Organized Crime. It confirmed once and for all what everybody suspected, that an organized criminal conspiracy was at work in the country. Even FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who for years denied their existence, finally had to admit it was true. Among the names of those picked up that day was an attorney from Downey, California named Frank DeSimone. He was indicted for contempt for not divulging the purpose of the Appalachian meeting, but the charges would eventually be dropped. His father was Rosario DeSimone, a longtime player in the LA Rackets. A USC graduate who was admitted to the bar in 1933 De Simone circulated among underworld figures for years, and at times even gave them legal counsel. After the death of Jack Dragna in 1956, he was said to have taken over as the boss of L.A. 
De Simone was said to be a straight-laced guy, but stories exist that describe an underlying ruthlessness, like the one about how he forced underboss Momo Adamo to watch as he raped his wife. The validity of the accusation is disputed, but is fueled by the fact that Adamo later shot his wife before turning the gun on himself. For years, the L.A. family was dismissed by the Chicago and New York families as the Mickey Mouse Mafia, and De Simone did little, if anything, to improve its reputation. However, it didn't stop Look Magazine in 1965 from naming him as one of the decade's most notable gangsters. Frankie responded in lawyerly fashion by suing the publishers for libel. After his name turned up on Joseph Bonanno's hit list, De Simone withdrew from sight. He retired to his home in Downey where he died of a heart attack at age 58. Having never married, he was buried beside his mother and father. Most don't often consider how we will be remembered when we're gone. When that day comes, we hope it will be for happy times and the good we've done. But sometimes the endeavors of a life well lived can be eclipsed when we become the unwitting participants of history. Our next visit is to a man who is on the road to achieving the American dream. He was the son of Italian immigrants who served his country honorably during World War II. He studied business at USC, married his high school sweetheart, became a father of three, and managed his family's chain of grocery stores. His first marriage didn't last, but he soon fell in love with a former waitress and seamstress and was remarried in 1960. Outside of his family, friends, and business associates, the world took little notice of Lino LaBianca, but all of that changed in the early morning hours of August 10, 1969, when Charles Manson came calling. On June 3, 1943, a group of sailors from the Naval Reserve Armory were assaulted by Mexican-American youths while returning from leave in Los Angeles. It was the culmination of weeks of escalating confrontations between white servicemen and the so-called pachucos who were known for their thuggish manner as well as their distinctive style of dress. After seeing their bloodied and beaten comrades, a gang of around 50 sailors went into the neighboring community and began attacking any young men they found and stripped them of their clothes. It was the first strike in what became the Zoot Suit Riots. Jose Gallardo Diaz was a 22-year-old farm worker whose family came to the United States from Mexico to escape the unrest that followed the revolution. He left school after the eighth grade to help support his family by working in the vegetable packing industry. The Diazes lived in the principally Mexican-American barrios of East Los Angeles. Jose's brother and sister remember him as a quiet and thoughtful young man and like most boys his age, he enjoyed swing music and the lifestyle that went with it, including the wearing of zoot suits. Music 
After the United States entered World War II, Jose, wishing to serve his adopted country, enlisted in the U.S. Army. The week before he was to report to boot camp, his mother asked that he have his picture taken. This is the only photograph of Jose Diaz that his family would ever have. A few days after it was taken, he attended the birthday party of a friend. At around 1 a.m., partygoers saw him leave with two other boys. Shortly after he left, members of the 38th Street Gang showed up looking for the ones who had beaten up their friends earlier in the evening. The brawl that followed would have tragic consequences. At dawn, Jose was found lying unconscious in the road near a swimming hole that locals called the Sleepy Lagoon, named after the popular song by Harry James. He had been severely beaten and stabbed, and was barely breathing when brought to the hospital. He died a short time later, having never regained consciousness. The press dubbed it the Sleepy Lagoon Murder, and a citywide crackdown on youth gangs followed. Over 600 Latinos were grilled by the LAPD. Inexplicably, the two boys last seen with Jose were not questioned. Eventually, 22 youths were indicted for Diaz's murder, resulting in the largest mass trial in California history. Anger in the Hispanic community rose over actions that seemed to be geared more towards prejudice of Mexican Americans than to bringing the killers of Jose Diaz to justice. The 22 defendants were not allowed to cut their hair or change their clothes during the first month of the trial, which many felt was done intentionally to make them look like unkempt hoodlums. They were also made to sit in rows facing the jury, which denied them the ability to consult with their attorneys. In the end, 17 of the 22 were convicted, three of whom were sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder. Outrage over the verdicts, coupled with the drunken behavior of servicemen coming into Hispanic neighborhoods, is ultimately what sparked the riots of June 1943. For eight days, the violence raged and in many cases, the LAPD either joined the attacking servicemen or look the other way. Finally, military and civic leaders were forced to step in. Los Angeles was made off-limits to members of the armed forces. The LA City Council passed an ordinance banning the wearing of zoot suits on the streets. A year later, an appeals court overturned the Sleepy Lagoon convictions and all the defendants were released after nearly two years in jail. The court also reprimanded the presiding judge for prejudice and hostility toward the accused. The murder of Jose Diaz remains unsolved, and his tragically brief life has been overshadowed by the events following his death that made him another unwitting participant of history. Today he rests in a quiet place, only a few miles away from the sleepy lagoon where he died. As our third and final exploration of Cavalry Cemetery comes to a close, let's take one last look before we go. For a moment, let's see beyond the grand monolithic monuments that stand above human proportion and focus our gaze on those hidden at our feet. We'll let the world above us go about its business as we quietly read the names that were long ago set into stone. These small memorials do not compare in grandeur to the others. Some we are unable to read, and there are those that have been reduced to fragments. But the persons buried beneath them were no less valuable 
and loved no less. And though there be no monument left to them, it does not change the fact that they once lived and played their parts in history. A friend once observed that the wind always seems to blow in cemeteries. I believe born upon that wind are the memories of countless lives that are no more, and they still have the power to reach us and to move us. For me it was a little boy dressed in a sailor suit named Juan. If he were still living as of 2018, he would be 100 years old. But fate gave him only three of those years. By now, even his parents, who mourned his passing, are gone too. And dandelions are the only flowers his grave ever sees. Nearby, water spills into a reservoir, as if measuring out all the tears that have ever been shed in this place over the decades. It is then that I begin to feel the weight of my thoughts. Then the wind starts to blow, and I think of Juan, and I think of all the others and realize that part of them is still here, and almost at once the weight lifts. If I've taken away anything from my journey of discovery at Calvary Cemetery, it's that no life is without significance or consequence. Whether we're inspired to build something, to teach, to write a poem, to pretend to be someone else, or to just show up at a birthday party, those decisions send out ripples that touch us all and move us in directions we might never have dreamed. Many years from now, after all present generations have passed from memory, future grave explorers will look back on us and contemplate the parts that we played. And then they'll feel the wind start to blow. Thank you for watching, and if you like what you saw, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in updates on future projects, you can follow me on Facebook by clicking the link in the description below. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel now for more grave explorations.